Welcome to Philosophy 15. I'm Robert Talese. I'm Scott Aiken. These are 15-minute at a stretch uh, conversations between two philosophers. We are unscripted, uh, just talking about whatever's on our mind. Uh, as you no doubt may know, uh, Scott and I are the authors of this year book, Why We Argue and How We Should, A Guide to Political Disagreement in an Age of Unreason. We're also uh, the authors of a book that um, actually... Uh, I guess it didn't come into existence today, but we learned of its existence today. Uh, somebody owns physical copies of our latest book, which is called, uh, you can't see this, uh, Political Argument in an Age of Unreason. Uh, um, I'm sorry, that's the wrong title. Political Argument in a Polarized Age. Now anyway. it's named. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, today... Uh, Scott uh, suggested that we should talk a little bit about Heraclitus. My response was, why? <laughs> why not? <laughs> uh, well, so, uh, yeah, who's got the burden of proof here? Well, how about this? Let's talk about Heraclitus because he's got interesting, he's got some strange things to say. We've, uh, in the past, talked a good deal about some pre-Socratic philosophers, some uh, Hellenistic philosophers, some Plato and Aristotle. Heraclitus is in some ways a kind of an interesting touchstone philosopher just in terms of uh, saying deep things. In fact, the story about uh, Socrates uh, hearing about Heraclitus saying that you'd have to be, have to be uh, a deep sea diver to understand what was going on in there. Uh, so uh, today we're going to just read a handful of little fragments from Heraclitus, uh, particularly focused on the doctrine of the unity, what's sometimes called the doctrine of the unity of opposites. I'm going to read just a couple, uh, a couple fragments and then we'll talk about them. All right. All right, here we go. So uh, how about this one? War is the father of all and king of all, and some he shows as gods, others as humans, and some he makes sl slaves and others free. Here's another one. Things taken together are whole and not whole, something that is being brought together and brought apart, in tune and out of tune. Out of all things there comes a unity, and there's a unity in all things. Just a couple more, just good ones. Uh, pigs wash themselves in mud, dirds in dust or ash. The most beautiful of apes is ugly in comparison with the human race. Um, I think that that's good. Well, how about this one? This is a good one. The track of writing uh, is both straight and crooked. Right, straight and crooked. And maybe the last one. Uh, the name of the bow is life, but its work is death. Bios. So, uh, the doctrine of the unity of opposites. Um, there's a strong interpretation that Heraclitus, uh, and in fact, uh, there's a there's a an interpretation of this that Aristotle takes up with in his Metaphysics, um, that um, that Heraclitus is committed to a really strong view that the doc that that the doctrine of unity of opposites really amounts to the thought that all things at bottom are indeterminate, or uh, or that they are determinate, but those they are determinate. Uh, contradictions, that he's resisting the law of non-contradiction, that all things in order for change to be both are and are not the things they are. Hmm. It's a pretty surprising view. Um, I guess one question here is why we would have to be committed to something quite that strong in order to make sense of change. Right, that does seem like it's um, trying to uh solve one kind of problem, the problem of explaining change right. by way of um, uh, a far worse kind of, creating a far worse kind of problem. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is in fact, like, this is sorry, the this standard is, story of a lot of philosophy. Yeah, and this is, this is, is, is this, this, this is part of the Aristotelian pushback, right? It's, oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so in fact, part of this is sort of setting Heraclitus up as part of Aristotle's story and saying, hey, look at this guy, he solves a problem, but he creates a bigger one. Lucky for everybody, I'm waiting at the end of this dialectic. Yeah. Um, so there's a kind of an Aristotelian triumphalism that's part of the story of Heraclitus being committed to the strong version of the doctrine of the unity of opposites. And I take uh, it that if you're committed to the strong version of the doctrine, the, um, the proper upshot would be to not write the fragments, but to be cratylous. 
Right. So, uh, in fact, the strong version is usually committed to, is actually attributed widely to Cratylus, one of uh, either a Heraclitus student or a sort of a, Her a practicing Heraclitean. Uh, the story was that if uh, that if the doctrine of unity, if you were truly committed to the doctrine of unity of opposites, uh, language wouldn't work. And in fact, this is Aristotle's line, which is that if you're committed to the doctrine of unity of opposites, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between your saying anything and you're not saying something or you're denying it and uh, as a consequence it doesn't look like language is doing it, it looked like we're saying something with the doctrine of unity of opposites and it looks like we're saying something that's different from denying the doctrine of unity of opposites uh, and so it looks like if you're committed to it you wouldn't be able to speak aristotle even says something like it makes you like a plant and we don't argue with plants we <laughs> you water them and walk away water them and walk away um and so one of the responses was uh, Cratylus's response, and there are a couple interpretations of that, which was that Cratylus said, uh, or uh, Aristotle says, is that it's you only respond by pointing your finger or moving your finger. So on the one hand, it could just be like a kind of a radical indexicalism, right? It's like that, this here now, this here now, and that's all you could say. Or the other interpretation is that uh, Cratylus just wiggled his finger, and that was the most communication you could get out. It's, Wiggle your finger. So uh, the, the isn't it, and Aristotle tells the, um, I don't know if it's Aristotle presents it as a story or if it's Aristotle inventing a joke uh, about Cratylus, where he says Cratylus scolded his teacher for claiming that it's impossible to step into the same river twice, for Cratylus saw that on the teacher's view you couldn't step into it once. You couldn't even do it once. Okay, so <laughs> the strong metaphysical unity of opposites doctrine looks um, unpromising right. to be charitable. Um, what are weaker? Well, weaker ones are ones uh, that, again, get kind of writ through Aristotelian, uh, um, Aristotelian lenses. I'll pause and say um, Aristotle tells the story of Plato, who studied under Cratylus, and said that Plato was a, a half Heraclitean and half Socratic. He thought that there were answers to definitions, but he thought that the world was Heraclitus was right about the world, and that's the reason why the world of becoming could not be a place of truth for Plato. You had to put the place of truth outside of the world of becoming because the world of becoming was a place where everything was always a little bit of this and that. Uh, and so th there's something to the strong interpretation of Heraclitus, if only because, at least in terms of being able to attribute it to him, and it looked like it was a serious kind of program, because it looks like it's something, it's the kind of view that Plato himself has, but it's the, Plato, the view that Pla the mature Plato himself has of one class of uh, things that at least are and are not the class of becomings. Uh, and then Plato had thought that for there to be truths and knowledge, there has to be another kind of set of beings for those things to be true, of, for definitions and our knowledge to be true of. The and weaker version, yeah. And that's also where Aristotle makes that same joke. Like, yeah. yeah, it's as if the world around here was 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 too much stuff to explain, <laughs> so you invent another world, other world with even more stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. So one of the one of the, the the ways to sort of draw that thesis a little bit back and be able to say, look, here's a much more plausible version, is to say that the things that are are capable of having contrary set of them, but at different times or from different perspectives. And so uh, and so whenever whenever one whenever we were to take say take a look at the the line that the line of writing is both straight and crooked, the Aristotelian response is to say, okay, or at the very least the one read through an Aristotelian lens is to say straight and crooked in different senses. It's straight in the sense in which it's, uh, it's capable of being written on a ruled line, for example, but it nevertheless is crooked in the sense in which it's not a line that runs parallel with that. All the lines that comprise that line of writing themselves are not parallel with it, but in fact are at all sorts of different wonky angles with regards to it. But those are separate senses of straight and crooked. And so one, uh, one sort of quasi-Aristotelian reading of Heraclitus is, again, the doctrine, the weaker version of the doctrine unity of opposites, is that things, the things that are, are capable of being able to bear 
uh, contraries, but over time. And those, uh, oh, and so we'd say something like, at one point in time, um, or, or in one sense, um, the 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 work the the. And so we take this even with regards to the bow case, right? The the name of the bow is life. Its work is death. That's an irony, but that's not even really a contradiction, right? <laughs> it's it's again, it's sort of pay attention to the meaning of the words that are in front of you. Um, and so this more modest interpretation is one that's in, in, in some ways supposed to be presenting the ways that our language can confuse us, be able to limber us up to be able to see how, ch see the possibility of change in front of us and the possibility of change that comes from us, uh, or th that we should be able to see here, is one that comes from our being able to see the way that being can allow for certain kinds of contraries uh, to kind of wash over it again, either over time or in different senses. Right, but aren't there also um, other fragments that make it seem as if the doctrine is not really a metaphysical doctrine at all, but more about the phenomenology or the experience, right? So, the things about being hunger, being hungry, and being satiated, right? Yeah. That you know, the 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 pain and the pleasure, right? The yeah. sort of so these ideas that the, are are either our experiences sort of come, um, the content of our experiences are in some way oddly fused with or dependent upon the opposite kinds of experiences, yeah. um, and our ability to identify certain features of our experience as such, that ability is somehow um, the product of some contrast. Right. So, uh, so there are two features to this which are which are useful, right? One is this contrastivism about the you might say the intelligibility of the contraries that you need one in order to understand the contrast class of the other one. The other one is a kind of perspectivism, and so uh, for example, we see with uh, with regards to the way that he's, uh, 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 Heraclitus has got the you know it looks like pigs take a bath in mud, right? It's like that's good for them, right? It's like or fish fish think that salt water is awesome; it's poison to us. That kind Kind of, and it's not even a point about the. In those sort of cases, it's not about the contrast. It's about the indexes. About like that. It turns out that a lot of these terms are indexed to the perceivers, uh, and so there is a hand. I mean, again, the the puzzle with being able to articulate what the full background system ultimately is. There's just a bunch of sort of rich uh, and sort of pregnant moments. But the more modest version is is a kind of perspectivism, uh, that you index a lot of these judgments to the kind of things that make the particular judgments, uh, that you index um, contraries in time and in space and in, 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 in uh, certain kinds of senses. Uh, and it looks like you get a sort of uh, and it, one of the surprising things is that at the end of this sort of more modest system, you get a very sane Heraclitus. Um, right. And so here's the puzzle, right, which is that Her the Heraclitean challenge is usually supposed to be something that is supposed to be a sort of a deep challenge about sort of saying that like really it's the, the war whenever he says war is the father of all that uh, everything is a sort of a big mix-up of all these sort of contraries um it looks like that lends us towards the sort of the more robust but more i got the more bonkers the bonkerier the bonkerier the the, the more bonkers view <laughs> Right, uh, but it, but and this is in some in some ways a kind of an interpretive question with regards to the history of philosophy. You get the much more robust but considerably less plausible Heraclitus. Uh, are we doing Heraclitus a favor by by doing that and saying something like he's the wild and woolly Heraclitus? It looks like he can't be right, but at the very least, he's really really interesting. Versus the other one, where it's like, well, he looks very plausible, but in fact, here's what's plausible about him. He kind of looks like once we kind of put all this through the sort of our vocabulary, we. Kinda kind of made him into kind of just one of us. Right. Um, and so there's a kind of a, an interpretive duality with Heraclitus. You can make him into a very sensible, uh, a very sensible philosopher in some ways, uh, but the challenge seems to have been lost uh, by, by doing that. Um, so, uh, and so you might call it the Aristotelianizing problem of Heraclitus. Right, good. So, but isn't the, the, the sort of sensible interpretation of Heraclitus that you're uh, uh, making present to us um, doesn't it have trouble with some of the fragments in which it looks like he is engaged in 
the same kind of what we might think of as sort of metaphysical or ontological project of the Milesians in that it's fire. Fire's the stuff. So yeah, there's another, there's a whole other, right. So it's uh, so gold got, for fire and fire for, fire for fire as gold for gold. That's is right. One of the, is one of the, one of the fragments. So, so there's a whole other, yeah, interpretation given the fact that he's from effectively that roughly yeah, I, uh, yeah, Ionian yeah. area that he's effectively doing another uh, Milesian physics kind of program that it's really fire that's at the bottom of it all. So if we take, uh, if we that's take. That's a third, that's a third, that's a third one. But yeah. how does one make sensible or how does that. How do the fragments that make it look as if he's making a claim that the substance of things is this destructive, fluxing... Yeah. Is that a word? This yeah, destructive, the flux, flux uh, kind of... Is, is fire a kind of stuff? Well, he says it is. It's right? a good model for the yeah, flux, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Good, I mean, good, it's good, better, right. than, better than dirt or... <laughs> yeah, it consumes Air, right? stuff. Yeah. Right? It turns yeah. things into things that they're not. Right. right. So um, how... How does the sensible view make sense of that? Uh, so I think that it's going to be that the sensible view is supposed to be that it, that that's just a metaphor. That he's not another Milesian physics program. That this is just a metaphor for the changes that we're looking at. Uh, and so the and so it's a way of being able to just say, look, it's another model to make sense of the sort of the 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 wild the wild changes. Um, and so. Um, so the challenge is in order uh, now again if you if you take if you the challenge for the sensible Heraclitean is the river doctrine right the 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 river doctrine is that you can't step into the same river twice and the sensible the sensible one is supposed to be like what the heck are you talking about like I go see the Mississippi like I, you know uh, it looks at and whenever you kind of take that whenever you take the river doctrine to be a sort of a central Heraclitean insight um, and you say look if you if you've got a if you've got an interpretation of Heraclitus that does damage to the river doctrine um, then that's that should count against it and it looks like the river doctrine is very much the sort of all is flux you don't get identity over time one of the ways that and one of the deep explanations as to why you don't have identity Identity over time is because of this doctrine of unity of opposites. So there's just no being underneath the fl the the flow of contraries. Mm. All right. Thanks, folks. Philosophy 15. See you on the next episode.